people are starting to join us now, which is lovely. Welcome, everyone. Let me start seeing some maker jammers coming in to join the discussion, which is fantastic. And, um, and I think the, we might kick off because I think we've got a lot of conversation to be having tonight. So um, welcome, everyone. Um, and thanks a million for, for choosing to join us tonight on this Saturday night on Zoom for our In Conversation event, Embodying, Performing, Sensing and Speculative Normality with the Human Cell Atlas, um, which is part of our virtual Maker Jam series of talks that are being hosted um, this week and next. Uh, so the, the whole mapping is a little bit like... Um... Excuse me. Oh, there's the <laughs> there. It's my speaking. <laughs> my speaking. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. No worries. Um, well, just to say, my name is Susie. For, don't, who, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Susie O'Hara, and I'm the project um, manager and curator of One Cell at a Time, which this project, it, this, this talk and the Maker Jam is part of. Um, it's an ambitious and multifaceted program of public events and public engagement activities. Uh, which are happening across the UK and internationally now online. Um, and it's part of the Human Cell Atlas. So the Human Cell Atlas, for those of you who aren't familiar at the moment, is a, is a truly global scientific research in initiative with more than 2,000 um, Human Cell Atlas researchers and members from over 75 countries around the world working to map every human cell type and Given that the body has 37 trillion cells, this is no mean task. And what they're looking to do is create a human Google map, which researchers can zoom into and understand every cell type across time and from development to old age. This work of the Human Cell Atlas will transform our understanding of biology and disease and could revolutionize the way illnesses and diag um, are diagnosed and treated and fundamentally um, has every potential to transform the future of our healthcare. It was co-founded in 2016 by Dr. Sarah Teichman from the Wellcome Sanger Institute in Cambridge here in the UK and Dr. Aviv Ragiv, then at the Broad Institute of MIT and Harvard in the USA. <clears throat> and if you want to find out more about the Human Cell Atlas, you can check out the link for the website that I'll drop in the chat after my introduction. And so what is one cell at a time? So as I say, we're the public engagement activity for the Human Cell Atlas in the UK. We're one of a number of programmes working to engage communities with the science of the Human Cell Atlas. And what we're doing is taking an art science approach um, through art and community driven projects. It's led by the Wellcome Sanger Institute and it's funded by the Wellcome Trust as part of a research engagement grant. Um, and it's designed to run parallel with the scientific um, uh, aspect of um, the HCA UK project, which is funded by a Wellcome Strategic Support Science Award. So the science of the Human Cell Atlas is, is being explored by a multidisciplinary community of biologists and clinicians, physicists, computational scientists, software engineers and mathematicians. And One Cell at a Time has expanded this ecology of expertise to include artists, creatives and communities. And back in October 2020, Four participatory art and science projects were commissioned to drive the delivery of our one cell at a time public engagement activity through the lens of art and science. Each city project was framed by a distinct yet interconnected team, providing the project with an opportunity to access a wide spectrum of artistic perspectives, methods and skill sets um, through the lens of, of four different themes. So embodying normality is Newcastle upon Tyne. We have performing normality in Cambridge. We have sensing normality in London and speculative normality in Oxford. And each of these projects critically responds to two questions that are fundamental to the success of the HCA uh, initiative. The first being, what is it to be normal? 
which obviously is a pertinent question for us all, um, particularly over the last year, but it's also a fundamental question for the HCA science. So they're looking to create a Google map of healthy human cells. And in order to do that, they need to understand the parameters of normality in order to be able to identify disease. And the second question, which is being explored by our maker jammers over the next week, is what influences pe people's value and trust in research involving tissue donation and open access data. So each city project is supported by a geographically located community engagement producer, all of whom are, are joining us today with our commissioned artists, with a remit to connect the, our artists to and the HCA members to particular communities in their target city. And also lead on the production of an ambitious public engage engagement programme of participatory events um, over the last eight or nine months. And I'm really delighted to welcome the whole team, all four of our city teams here tonight for our In Conversation event to reflect a little bit on their experiences of creatively responding to the science of the HCA to socially engaged art making. And so our format will be that each city artist, um, commissioned artist will have 15 minutes to talk about their project. And this will be followed by um, uh, what their, their kind of community engagement producer, their cultural producer, um, reflecting, giving them, having some time to reflect on their own experiences and maybe asking a, a question, a provocation for their, their artist to answer. This will go to each of the four commissions before opening it up to you guys so to join our In Conversation. And so without further ado, I'm really pleased to welcome Stacey, um, Phyllis Adias and Dominic Smith to talk about the Newcastle Commission embodying normality. Thank you. Hi everyone, thanks so much for joining us this evening. Um, this presentation specifically is going to focus on some of the stories that have been told as part of this project and really try and unpick some of the themes and things that have been brought out through this commission and some of the ways that my thinking has shifted across it. So um, at the beginning of this commission, I had a kind of a hunch, I had an instinct and I kind of, I really wanted to explore the kind of how organ donation and kind of our donation towards scientific resources is, is or isn't mirrored by something which is called the natural death movement or the eco death movement. So most people are uncomfortable with ideas of being hooked up to a machine. Most people are uncomfortable with the medicalized nature of death. Most people really appreciate and respond really well to the idea of a natural death and of um, your body going to the earth and all these kinds of metaphors that come with it. Um, in the last 10 to 15 years, maybe a bit longer, Ecological concerns about the environment and our climate and our world have also pushed forward this trend of eco burials to see people's political beliefs being really strongly embedded within this idea of um, end of life ritual. And I wanted to explore whether something like scientific advancement or something like um, the way that we might think about ritual practice as a way of gifting or giving our body or a mutual exchange of our body after we die to create material for scientific advancement might be something akin to this kind of eco-burial idea. Sorry, long-winded introduction. Um, and some of the interviews that I had with some of the HCA members kind of supported this. So people talked about the fact that if people talked more about death, there would be more conversations about organ donation. And at first I kind of thought, yes, of course, I think about death talk a lot. I think about the, the reason behind that. But as I got deeper into this topic, I also realized that actually organ donation is much more complicated for very many diverse reasons. And there's a lot of um, questions within areas of organ donation that maybe aren't as prominent in something like eco burial. So one of the first ones is, you know, what happens to our body when it's donated? What do people do with it? And these ideas of people dissecting bodies, people, some of the HCA scientists called this, people imagine bodies being hacked apart. So kind of some of the art and the imagery, when you look up dissection of bodies, these are the kind of things that come up. A whole lot of men staring at a dead body and opening it up, looking at it in different angles. 
there's a lot of issues with this image. And if we want to see it as something which is positive or see it with something that is about advancement, see it in a way which makes us feel comfortable and which doesn't problematize this. Of course, there are lots of problems and I'd like to get into some of those as well. I wanted to draw attention to um, this kind of case, the immortal life of Henrietta Lacks. And I think it brings through some of the myriad of ethical, social, cultural, race-based issues around donation and consent and kind of the muddy field around that. And possibly also the way that a lot of these ethics have shifted, but perhaps in people's minds, they still see this. So, you know, Henrietta Lacks, um, had her tumors cultured and was died unrecognized and buried in an unmarked grave. The doctor Gray, who cultured her cells, went on to facilitate groundbreaking research with cancer, AIDS, Parkinson, effective radiations, toxins on humans, gene mappings, salmonella, tuberculosis, et cetera, et cetera. It was revolutionary. Her cells reproduced massively. They went all over the world. They created this form of immortality, this kind of embodied immortality that transhumanists could only dream of. And yet Henrietta Lacks remained unaware. Henrietta Lacks' family remained unaware. As I said, she died unrecognized and was buried in an unmarked grave. Her family didn't benefit from the selling and buying of patents and other things that came along with this case. So there are lots of issues that kind of come across within this that I think are worth sort of mediating on before thinking about what the, that conversation around organ donation could look like. Um, when I talk about a HCA member, the scientist, when I talk about the, the kind of interviews, sometimes interviews have been collided together to create more an, an, an anonymity for the scientists. So sort of bringing together, but one of the scientists remarked on this idea that they are working with people and tissue and that perhaps that might be something quite unique um, this idea of working across the whole process from working with people to get consent through to working with tissue in the lab um, is something that really interests me in, in terms of this idea of a more personal and more relational approach to donation and to, to thinking about data and tissue. So she talks about one of the reasons that parents don't give consent for their children to contribute part of their tissue is that they're worried about what will happen to their data if it's going to be kept forever and if it's going to be shared around. So these kind of questions of trust and transparency kept coming up across this commission. Um, and certainly those, those images of or urban myths of unethical dealing with body, bodies, possibly not urban, I don't know, you know, but anyway, this kind of nature of um, that people don't know what goes on inside these spaces and people worry about what will happen to them. But then going deeper into these conversations with the scientists, um, we have these different layers and these different levels. So we've got person, we've got tissue, we've got sample, but we've also got lots of care. I was really struck by whenever scientists talking about people's tissue, the care that was involved in talking about those people, talking about the tissue, talking about the ethics involved, respecting the dead being something really key. So respecting the fact that someone has gifted or given or donated that thing. And only occasionally I've had encounters of data, although some of the scientists, you know, it might be that the people that are wanting to be interviewed by us are not seeing it in that way. So data is still something that's there. And the kind of the, the, the details around the ethics where people possibly are not really aware. So very specific. There are lots of very specific guidelines about what can be done with tissue, how long it can be kept, whether slides can be made or something that lasts forever, whether a person wants experiments but no slides or whether they want no immortal cells. And, you know, this conversation moved on and, you know, we began talking about, well, can you take your samples with you? You know, these samples that have been, you know, really carefully collected and curated over many years. And the scientist replied, well, I spent four years collecting this data but if I leave my job, I can't take it with me. And that can be tough. And also this kind of conversation about increasing commercial interests in samples and the tension between the medical benefit of combining pharma money with academia's modes of trust. But these collaborations then exacerbate those issues of trust among the scientists and the academics. So, the, you know, this kind of question mark. 
And it got me thinking to some of the things that have been within my research for many years. So this is a quote really, or a, a little statement about digital inheritance. So the things that we inherit from those people we love. And it says, these objects have an agency that transform them into matters of concern that need to be cared for. And it just struck me. It struck me that that's what I was feeling about how the scientists were caring for the tissues and the cells and things that they were transformed in this way. Um, one of the scientists also remarked, tissue is invaluable. Blood only gives us a little shadow of what's going on. And it reminded me of this artwork by Tim Noble and Sue Webster, where we kind of see the difference between the amalgamation of stuff and the shadow that's produced on the wall and the kind of questioning between those two spaces. Um, I was also really struck by the presentation at Hanifa Lab and the fact that these um, mapping of cells using big data and other kinds of tools are really re reminiscent of the mappings that we find in social media platforms like Pulsar, where different tweets and things are mapped together. And one of the data wranglers that we interviewed talked about how there are certain thresholds where um, quantity becomes a quality of its own and people, other scientists can use it to find the nitty gritty details and also about the immense time that's saved. So people could have spent in the past two or three years finding the research papers, looking behind paywalls and all that work is effectively done for them in this case. And that really fascinated me around these kind of cells and populations and things. Um, we did this series of workshops. Um, so one of the workshops that we've been doing was with the scientists um, around developing a post kit that we could send out to people that would stimulate some of these more complex conversations around body tissue and data donation. And they consisted of a series of figures that would have different little um, prompts on them and a series of objects in a Petri dish. Uh, these are just some of the forms that we use sort of to, to invite people to take part. Um, and this is what the kit looks like. So you can see these different objects and prompts and I'm kind of fast forwarding because I want to go into the next bit of this presentation. So although I can't really share what's been put in the kits apart from a couple of photos that people have sent us specifically to share, I can go through some of the data amalgamated. So some of these things, for example, talk about how they wish science would be more inclusive of diverse people, be accessible, be listened to, more funding, um, and the way that, you know, they believe after death that we enter the void and leave traces of our energy, et cetera. Um, so I tried to, as I said, amalgamate some of the data so people could, handwriting could be identified and other things. And this particular um, Petri dish thing says to name as many words as you can think of that describe donating your body after death. And people thought it was important, difficult, valuable, scary, uncertain, necessary, helpful, resource, impersonal, strange, release, gift, listening, curious, suspicious, wary, fine, no problem, glad it's of use, bravery, hope, love, life, future, among others. Um, but I thought this cross section of words really shows the diverse responses and reactions to this topic and how this project sort of fits into that. And the same with this one around donating parts of your body. So someone says organs, helpful to others, okay. Distinctive features like eyes, for example, may be strange. Reproductive cells, hmm. And another person saying, I take the view that when I'm gone, I won't know, so do take what is needed. But yes, it feels strange to think about eyes, heart, liver, kidneys, as being really embedded within personal identity and then being extracted from the body and removed to something else. I thought these two visualizations, some of the prompts are actually about drawing things. So these two visualizations of mapping the body were what inspired the workshops as part of the Maker Jam. So someone talking about the north, south, east and west of their body and another person just creating this form, you know, of lungs and heart and brain, which I find really humorous. I actually really adore that, that image. Um, and talking about their beliefs, saying that they are a mass of cells that will disintegrate but they also just want to believe that there's some agency after death. So the kind of parallels between what was said earlier by the scientists and the kind of relationship that people have to their bodies post-death. These are some of the visual imagery and advertising around organ donation, particularly um, since the change of law. 
So again, the language is around gifting. So a gift of life. And this really provocative advert from Scotland that actually was maybe going to be taken down, but wasn't, gives you the opportunity to save or kill Jill, yes or no? Do you donate your organ to her or not? Is she gonna disintegrate into space or not? Really provocative, but also these kind of like, you know, showing the organs in the air, what do we have? And similarly in this really new campaign actually from the 12th of March, which I found great because it's actually also about kind of augmented reality and filters and stuff which is from the NHS where you can actually look at your body and see what you could donate and your body can do amazing things. Obviously it seems to be aimed at a slightly younger audience. So really interesting. And it's a team up with Snapchat. So creating this kind of collaborative space. And then really, really briefly, something that we're planning to do for this um, installation that we're, we're actually working more on the technical part of this at the moment. So that's why I don't have huge amounts to show but it's an XR application for a journey-based experience where participants will follow a route that leads to a series of geolocated objects that can be exchanged virtually to explore concepts of body tissue and data donation and bring focus to research insights that include themes of trust, digital intimacy, mutual exchange, and tissue donation. So again, mutual exchange was something that came up a lot. So this idea of what do you give and what do you get back? When you donate blood, you get back this message saying what's happened to that blood. When you donate tissue to a research group, you get back something that talks about what that's, what's happened with that and perhaps is useful for your own medical health and history and stuff. And this is just a really, really basic kind of what we call in the trade, a kind of Wizard of Oz, where I've just thrown a few things together to give you an idea of what it might look like. So this is an augmented reality app where you see this population of liver cells up ahead. And it just asks you, would you like to donate your cells? And as I said, this hasn't been de designed. This is not an interface. It's what we would call a kind of digital sketch. So, um, thank you so much for listening. And I hope I didn't go too fast and, cover too many crazy amounts of things um yeah well that was absolutely perfect stacy thank you so much for that whistle stop absolutely bull of us bull of us i'm going to pass over to dominic smith who's your um community engagement producer to do a bit of reflection himself and potentially prov um, provide a question uh, yes um so um, we were asked to provide a, a provocation which feels like a strong kind of uh, statement. So, so I wrote a strong provocation, uh, actually. But I just wanted to say there was there was one really, really, the, the workshops that we had with the people were really, uh, really interesting, and they were met with a range of uh, approaches. Some of which being humour as well, you know, humour about how, and humour being a defence uh, mechanism we've all got at times. But one participant said that they uh, they did hope to come back as a ghost so that they could haunt their children. Which was uh, just a great moment in the workshop, I thought. Uh, but yeah, so um, my provocation is probably too glib. I'm kind of, you know, when you write these things and then think, oh, should I say it? But whenever you start a project, you you assess your options. You think about um, where it can go and um, how many people can get involved, all the different kind of aspects of planning. And one of those questions you should always ask yourself is, should we do it at all? Should we, why are we doing this? You know, and it's a really useful question to ask yourself at the start of a, of a big project. And so my provocation, I guess, was, uh, and I'll, I'll delve into this a little bit, I won't just leave it at this kind of statement, but um, was, uh, why do this at all? Why not leave people alone? Uh, why participate in any of this? Uh, why not just let science do science? And why not just let art do art? Why do the two things need to meet? which is a, a, a fairly uh, heavyweight question to ask at this point in the uh, One Cell at a Time project, where we, it's exactly what we've been doing the whole time. Um, but I guess uh, it really relates to how we are all connected as well. Um, it, it, that question gives us an opportunity to think about how we are all part of a network uh, and you know how we all uh, are parts of communities and how we're all participating in arts and culture and, and science and medicine all the time. You know, you don't sit watching the television thinking I'm participating in light entertainment right now. And you don't go to the dentists and in the middle of a filling think I'm participating in dentistry, but we're all kind of, we are all connected in some way. Um, 
so really i just wanted to throw that over to stacy why why is it important why is it to create this nexus this meeting point between these different disciplines i think there's a there's a few different kinds of answers to that to that question obviously there's hundreds of different kinds of answers to that question but one of the things that people in the um in the community groups actually said to us was that um data data by itself often is not enough they don't get enough from it they don't get an emotive response to it and actually they need some kind of translation they need some kind of like way of seeing the meaning in the, that data in those data sets and i think one of the things that art and design are really good at is providing these these placeholders these spaces for gathering conversations for gathering communities for gathering thinking and if anything the beginning of the presentation showed that those those questions of trust that you know maybe some scientists think no the scientists don't the scientists know that those questions of trust still exist but like you know which the ethical bodies have really tried to pin down and most of the scientists really care as i said that 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 feeling of care was massively there but not something that I even was really necessarily aware of, like how much that tissue was cared for. Mm. Um, and I think that those kind of questions of trust and transparency link back to those examples where science has failed people and has failed to be ethical and, ha you know, and so there's that kind of tension across time and history where people still, they're still in that place. They, mm. you know, some people, people still feel there's something troubling potentially or there's something dangerous potentially about giving their tissue giving their data and yes there is something but also you have this group of people that really care and so i think that art and design can can provide some of those bridges between the, the public and the scientists and try and create those placeholders for those conversations to happen which maybe couldn't happen in the lab or in the medical ward or when you go and ask someone for that sample, because that's a really distressing time and difficult time to begin to think about those questions and answers. That's a great response, Stacey. I really, I really, uh, that really resonates, I think, this opportunity to open space, to do kind of enable pathways into maybe something that seems quite opaque, whereas actually there's a very big motivation to you know, be much more transparent about how things happen and build trust in those ways. Um, so thank you very much for that fascinating provocation, Dominic. Um, fantastic, I'm, re I'm really pleased and delighted to um, welcome our Cambridge commissioned artist, Anna MacDonald to come up next. Anna has taken the theme of performing normality um, as her commission lens to look through. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to throw the floor over to Anna MacDonald. Thanks very much, Susie. Let me share this with you. Mm, okay. So hello, everyone. It's really lovely to be here. And that was a, a really fabulous, rich start there. And um, yeah, it's given. Uh, yeah, I think some of what I'm going to say kind of ad ad addresses that idea of the relationship between different ways of knowing in art and science and how they might be useful. So I am a dance and moving image artist, and I work at the Manchester School of Arts, part of Manchester Metropolitan University, and. Um, I'm very lucky I work in an, a department where practice based research and different forms of knowledge are very valued um, and it, it's sort of that's it's not a fight I have to fight and. Um, so it's really that's lovely and it's also really enjoyable to be part of this project where the value of art is taken as a given and uh, that that's a delight to start from that point not not every project does, as, as many of the artists here will know. So I think uh, often my work gets framed as a uh, knowledge exchange. So I use my practice, my movement, my embodied movement, my digital practice, my film, to both generate and exchange knowledge between different communities. 
So really, I, I think of that as uh, creating an exchange between different ways of knowing. So uh, an overview of how I work is that I use performative and somatic processes, so body-based processes, working with people generally over quite a, a long length of time. And by people, I mean different members of the public, generally people that don't come from a dance background but might have an interest in movement. Uh, but even if they don't have an interest in movement, I work with them anyway. And um, I, I draw on the findings that emerge from that process to make artworks. And those, the aim of those artworks is to generate uh, an effective engagement with ideas. And then I collate responses to those artworks and fold it back into, into writing and into publications. So for ways of doing things, um, I'm really seeing and you know, encouraged by the frame that Susie's set up here um, is that we have the human cell atlas work uh, on one side and, and a delightfully wavy line that leads to the wider public and that I'm the artist working with the public, generating artworks that really act as a kind of bridge between those different, uh, those different stakeholders, those different people. So um, I believe in working with the public as experts. So experts whose lived experience can offer new perspectives, new ways of thinking and understanding. And when we began work on this commission, um, Matt and Hilary, my producers and I, we were thinking about why people give and um, in thinking about why people might give tissue or might not give tissue, it felt important to think about or what, what is it to also receive. And I remember hearing a talk from one of the HCA researchers really early on, um, I think it was Chris, who was talking about the act of receiving. You know, they have this very short time frame in which they can receive tissue and disseminate the tissue. And the so this sort of speed and care and rigor of the protocols. So the receiving felt like an area that was less, um, less thought about perhaps in, in the process, the emphasis being on, on, on giving. So it felt important to, to look at that. So we began by working with two groups of people, one being a group of people with lived experience of issues connected to organ donation, and another group of people, uh, young carers, um, aged between nine and 13, who have direct lived experience of giving, giving their time, giving their attention, their energy uh, to another. So we've been working with these experts not to get direct answers to questions, but really using that work as a catalyst to create thought about how large scale medical research such as the HCA is perceived, what a normal body in health might be, and why we might donate or not to research. And one of the things from my perspective as a dancer that really interested me about the HCA work was the idea of searching for something that you don't know is there. And this felt very different to my rather naive perspective of kind of, I guess what I assumed was a very positivist model of science as something that creates experiments designed to address existing problems or something that seeks to prove an existing hypothesis. When Moz described looking and listening to what was already there, these vast data sets of cells in the hope of finding something, of finding patterns of correlations and variations and matches, it felt speculative and hopeful and mysterious and slightly frightening because there's also the possibility that they won't find something. And in the interview for the commission was used the image of a, a galaxy, you know, that they were going out and, and, and charting <laughs> Star Trek style um, places are not yet known. And that felt comforting because there was a great similarity there between this process and the way I work with people to generate art. And that really involves staying with them, listening and working with what emerges from the conversations 
rather than realizing an idea that I already have. So when working with the uh, transplant recipients and the young carers, it's, it's uh, a slow but engaged process. And the focus is on translation and exchange rather than disseminating a single point of truth. And then from that, uh, the artwork emerges in response to what comes out. So I see, really see my job here is, is one of holding uncertainty. Uh, and that's a tricky thing uh, within uh, large funded projects. And that really has to be supported by a, a belief in what art can do, which is something I've, I've really felt through this process. And it's been um, a, a real delight. So um, yeah, how we work. So we meet, we've been working since um, October together and we meet every two weeks and we dance together every time that we meet. We meet online, of course, uh, create a holding space, a very contained, regular space. Uh, where we can come together. I don't work directly with questions connected to tissue donation or even transplant experiences. I, I describe it very much as working from the side. So uh, talking about giving and receiving, we might start from taking pictures of things that we've been given. Um, or thinking about what it is to offer a gesture of asking, the vulnerability of holding your hand out towards another of the palm or the soft inside of the wrist being exposed. Uh, and from those embodied uh, actions and experiences, then thinking about what it is to receive and then going back out into the HCA work. So one of the things that emerged very early on from that was the idea of matching, matching as connection, matching as a part of finding pattern, as a, a part of the research of creating maps and atlases. And um, yeah, so, um, <laughs> Yeah, what, what, one of the things that I, I, I did was um, invite one of the HCA researchers in to talk to the groups and uh, Isaac uh, came and gave a fantastic presentation about his work. And then I asked people to respond to his presentation. So again, this act of translation. So how might you respond to what's being said? Um, because I can't speak for the HCA and uh, but what I'm interested in is what they understand of the HCA's work as a way of reflecting back how that work is understood. And um, we got a variety of really fantastic responses back. Um, one uh, response from Mary was that um, in response to the idea that all DNA is the same in the body and uh, then enacts differently in different cells, after which was very quick to point out that, of course, all DNA is not the same in their body because they have a different organ within them and they are chimeras. And that led to lots of conversations about um, bodies not being the same and how we can hold difference. How can we make a map and hold difference in our, in our body and recognize difference in, in different people's bodies? And that theme came up really again and again in terms of um, how do we make something understandable without simplifying that and losing the diversity? How do we um, map something that has no finite point? Um, and how can we do something that ultimately is, is kind of still useful uh, and yet holds that complexity? So how can we look at multiple truths and possibilities and yet still be useful? And so we came back round to whether, you know, what could be useful in science and whether art could be useful if it doesn't reach finite or uh, kind of definitive points. So um, when we were looking at pattern, we might do things like I would invite them to take a walk 
And then I would invite them to take the same walk again and then perform the differences that they found. I might invite them to look out of the window until a pattern emerged and then to enact that pattern. And then all the time we would move together, dance together using our hands to try and find the similarities, the close matches, the correlations and the experience of connection. So um, I've got a couple of little things to show if there's time. But the model we used, and this came again from uh, talking to one of the HGA researchers um, about public engagement, and I, and I asked them who they wanted to know, again, thinking about this, how can we hold this diversity? Because of course the public isn't one thing, and there are many publics. And I wanted to know, well, who do you want to know about your work? Because as an artist, that's the, one of the first things you think about, well, who is this artwork for? And so I, that felt an important question. And the response I got was surprising. It, um, I think it was Kirsten, wasn't it, Susie? You can, you can probably tell me, but um, she, a very, yeah, a very senior researcher. And she said, oh yeah, you know, what I really want, what I really love is to be able to speak just to one or two people directly and for them to truly understand and share my excitement about my research. And I was so taken by this, this, you know, yes, it's important that we reach a wide audience, but for her, what was important is that you really understand the excitement, not the science, but the excitement. And so we worked on a public engagement model, which went from this very focused engagement with small numbers. And those of you who live in ref world will understand that kind of small number, high impact and then rolling it out. So we went from the small focus group and then I asked them to think of 10 people that would benefit from hearing about the HCA work through them. So then we had these wider workshops with a larger group of people. And in that workshop, I invited the participants to talk about the HCA work from their own perspective. So we had an HCA researcher, we had the participants' response to that work, then we had movement responses to that work out to the public, and then hoping that they would then take that out and talk to more people about it. If I have a minute, could I show a couple of little things? Yes, you can. Okay, you're very kind. Now, I have one that's three and one that's two. So you could... There's probably not time for both. So would you like to see a little thing with the young carers or would you like to see something with an HCA researcher? Can I have a show of hands for young carers, please? I knew you'd choose them. Okay, there you go. It's really hard, isn't it, not to choose people who are, yeah, yeah. You'd have to be pretty hard-nosed not to do that. Here we go. So this is just a sketch of something that we will make in a more realized way. Um, and they were invited to think about gestures of giving and gestures of care and everyday things that they do as a young carer and what was normal for them. And one of the things I was so struck by with them is that actually they didn't want to talk about the care. They didn't want to talk about giving. They didn't think that was amazing for them actually it was a source almost of shame because it indicated something was wrong and needed correcting. And I had to take about 16 steps back at that point and really, so we got to a lot of this work through kind of pop songs and poppets and that anything but care is sort of how we arrived there. Anyway, have a little look at this. Okay, can you see that all right? Hi, Eleanor, this is Susie O'Hara calling to know Human Atlas Project. Um, I'm just wondering if you wouldn't mind giving me a quick call back. My number is 0789 9319. I look forward to hearing from you.
All done. Most of us have dogs. All of us care for someone in the household. All of us like chocolate. All of us do chores. All of us are human beings. All of us ride bikes. All of us get frustrated. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. For that horrific shock of hearing my own voice played back at me. Yeah, I don't know what that's about. I just felt like it was when you phoned me to say that I got the commission. You left me. <laughs> I just, it just sort of felt, I don't know, something about that needed to be there somewhere. I hope Susie's filled in a, a media consent form for that. <laughs> exactly. Without further ado, Matt, have you. Um, Pass the, the, the mic over to you for a few minutes to ask a, a, a question. Hi everyone, I'm Matt. I'm um, community engagement producer for Anna. I'm also artistic director of Cambridge Junction. Um, for those that don't know that already. Um, I've been really fascinated by this sort of iterative process that um, Anna and we have gone through on this project and how dynamic and organic and uh, intimate that has become obviously in a time when we've been isolated in various ways and locked down and unable to meet in person where Anna's process is physical and in person very often and uh, finding ways and approaches methodologies to find new ways of finding intimacy through um, through the work that we've been doing. I think as Anna's talked about, the, you know, the act, the gesture, the movement of caring, uh, of giving and donating and receiving has, has, has become incredibly moving. I think there's something uh, unbelievably moving, I think, in just seeing someone's hands, even if you, you're anonymized to a large extent, it feels very, um, you feel very close to those people and when we first um, played some of this game with Susie and Hilary and Anna and I in, in a Zoom not dissimilar to this there was, a, it, it was there was a stillness and a quiet to it which was really fascinating um, and I think you know that that's also sort of mirrored some of the you know as as Anna said the 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 provocation from from Kirsten was at the HCA member around being able to speak directly to people. I think being able to hold or um, have a sense of that emotion of the act of sharing, the act of togetherness, the act of um, matching, um, and exploring that with these sort of temporary and and also un unaware communities, as Anna's sort of sort of skip through actually this sort of um the unaware community of people uh taking their medicine at the same time each day um where they they the, this is the donor recipients where they are obviously taking taking medicine and other people in the country or all over the country are probably taking their medicine at the same time and and that realization that they are are similar to those people in that way and unaware of that similarity 
was I, I think also incredibly moving and I, yeah we've, I've been really fascinated by Mary's provocation of, of the chimera and how that that also mirrored this kind of you know as you'll know a chimera is also something that is impossible to achieve and the the impossibility of the 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 task that HCM members have of creating this map you know the it has been said to us by HCO members that they, they may never finish this process. So that impossibility, I think, is really uh, tangible. And um, I was just struck then, actually, there's something that I've, I've, I've thought about a lot in my career as a programmer, and that is, you know, anybody working in the art, there's all in the arts there's all in the art in the arts there's there's always this tension between art and entertainment and i've always been very interested in that particularly programming multi-art form venues where we will do contemporary performance practice and we'll also do comedy and we'll do small gigs and we'll do big commercial gigs so entertainment is a real tension in there and i've always played with this idea the, the derivation of entertainment is um old French, I think, uh, and it means to hold within. And obviously to hold within probably just meant something that you performed inside a building somewhere. But I've always been interested in the fact that um, you could define it as something that is held within us as we, the things that we take from that encounter with a piece of art. And I think there's, there's something um, in Anna's process, which I think um, will, give members will give uh the public a sense of that care of holding uh the tissue that we are donating the the research that we are creating from that the 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 importance both of our our gift of tissue and uh, the sort of preciousness of receiving that as well i think being able to hold that sensation that emotion through the very simple act of matching your hands to one another, I think is really, um, I'm, I'm bound to say that it's really smart, I think, Anna. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, so that's not much of a provocation. I'm I was not, gonna say, not, have you got going, a question? I'm, I'm loving, get, I I'm love not, all this, but you know, is there a question? I don't know whether I've got a question. I, mean, I, 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 think, I think you've run out of time for your question. You're gonna yeah, have to no, take it to the after, after the Q&A, yeah. sadly. Yeah, sorry. But really fascinating thoughts Thanks. though. I really enjoyed listening to your reflections, actually. Really, I was really responding more than questions, sorry. No, really valuable. Thank you so much, thank you. But I will move on. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, Matt. And I'm really pleased to welcome Amanda um, and Rose bowman Leahy. Uh, to share their screen and present their work. And they've been working with Justine Bussard in London on the Sensing Normalcy theme of a One Cell at a Time program. Thank you. Thank you, Susie. And thank you, everyone, for some really fascinating talks. It's nice to hear more about the back, oh, the insights of all this amazing work. Um, is, does that work for everyone? Is it not too yeah. pixelated? Yeah. yeah. So, um, okay, let's do this. Yes, most of you, I think, know us uh, and our work, but we will do a really brief introduction. Uh, I'm Amanda and Rose with Bauman Leahy. And um, we are artists who collaborate with experts across disciplines to question and sensorialize scientific research into these tactile participatory experiences. And we often use future scenarios as ways of engaging uh, with the possible trajectories of new research. And then for the past couple of years, and for this project in uh, particular, we use the frameworks of ceremony and ritual as ways to process uh, all this information. As artists invited to engage in this incredible research uh, at the Human Cell Atlas, we're interested in questions such as, what does this scientific encounter with our bodies as cells mean on an emotional and existential level? And how can we create maps that reflect this sense of wonder, enchantment and respect towards our bodies? And then can we learn from ritual ceremonies and beliefs across cultures to help us navigate this landscape of mapped bodies? 
So one thing that we were particularly interested in when we started this project was this relationship between the notion of donor and data and this process of transformation of messy, fleshy, porous bodies becoming quantifiable values and indicators. And so we've been really intrigued in this idea of what the donation process and datification of bodies could mean in order to encapsulate or extend itself to the complex lives of those that have been, who that have given their bodies to become researched in this way. So the words tissue and donor and data are words that hold depths of biological and personal and societal relevance. And yet rarely most of us will speak about these words in ways that are entwined with our own lived realities and ways of making sense of the world. And so we've been exploring this connection and found this as a, as a fascinating starting point. As the London team, our brief was to engage with communities in Southwark, South London, and we zoomed into one particular uh, area of Southwark called Peckham, which is a very culturally diverse neighbourhood where religion, community and art uh, are very prominent. Responding to this location uh, led us to the question of how the science of human cell atlas, and in particular, the reliance on tissue and organ donation, would sit with different cultures and belief. To put it shortly, uh, we asked how can we triangulate art science and spirituality and what might come out of it? And of course, how do we do this in a way that's respectful, sensitive and not appropriating of someone else's culture? One way we've been doing this is to put together an incredible pa panel of local people with expertise in spiritual and health rituals to discuss these ideas, including a former GP uh, who now runs a yoga studio and a local vicar. We've also hosted uh, two public workshops where we invited community members to reconnect with their cells and explore their gut reactions to the human cell atlas as it's shaping up now as well as think about the possible futures of cellular biology, which we'll talk a bit more about. Um, on this slide you see here, it's from a mirror board where we were comparing the phases of a ritual to st stem cell differentiation in the gut, one of the uh, areas of the human cell atlas research that we're still very interested in exploring, this point where cells uh, differentiate to become one type of cell or another, to become normal or abnormal. What's been uh, really great for us has been to bring together Human Cell Atlas members and community participants. And now we're excited to bring in some new voices, uh, your maker Jammers voices into the mix uh, as makers with great skills who can try and translate some of all this complex knowledge into tangible outcomes, but also as people with uh, diverse experiences, backgrounds and beliefs. So we would love to hear about this. Uh, we've been recurring to this provocation of how we can create a scenario where the 3D imaging of a fully mapped cellular body becomes layered with meaning of uh, memories, emotions and associations of those who experiences it. Could the public engaging in the human cell atlas do so in a way where they're not just recipients, donors or the curious looking up this interface online, but also be able to come up to it as a source of emotional uh, or personal healing and processing of this information. Oh yeah, should I stop screen sharing? So our process to try and imagine what, uh, what this could look like was to draw on the method of world building. Um, we engaged in with the researchers and the members of the public uh, through this method of creating new narratives, storytelling and imagining together. And we find this method of world building really key in our work. It's something we use uh, a lot and to explore what's different and alternative futures there could be um, in the case of this, both in the near future outcomes of research, such as the human cell atlas, but also the longer term legacy of cellular biology projects like this. And world building has really been our, um, our way of approaching this theme of normality and questioning what normalities do we build for ourselves? What normalities are built for us? And what do we wish to see as normality in the future? And we've been using this world building method through some various explorative frameworks, which were mapping 
speculative storytelling and sensory ceremonies, which we'll talk a bit about now. So in our mapping workshop, it was our first workshop with members of the public and human cell atlas researchers mapping ourselves ourselves. We asked participants to imagine how a human cell atlas could look and operate like. And if they were to create their own human cell atlas, what would this be and what would it include? We sent workshop packs containing kits with a booklet inside, um, which in the workshop we drew and wrote inside. And they included images and stickers as well, which people collaged here. It had questions such as what does your cell atlas, what would your cell atlas look like? What would it include? And what is your gut reaction to the idea of a human cell atlas? And we had some really, really great and diverse responses. Um, ones imagining systems that could care for your body and all your microbial inhabitants. We had one uh, imagining if your if a cell atlas where your body's emotional health uh, is revealed as well as the physical and systems that would be entwined with ecological health. And then we, uh, from all of the incredible conversations we had with the public and human cell atlas researchers, we got inspired to further develop this direction uh, using speculative uh, futures or speculative storytelling, uh, trying to write scenarios that veer away from the uh, dystopian or utopian, but uh, somewhere open that allows for this, these multiple futures to emerge. Um, and we feel this kind of emergence is reflected in the nature of the human cell atlas, where new knowledge production, new technological opportunities and input from a global community of researchers, uh, more practically also in the way that the points list spatial transcriptome maps are built, reflects also in the, the One Cell at a Time project, uh, which kind of aims to extend and translate this open-endedness and emergence into uh, the greater collective of people and uh, we're so happy to be part of this way of working and believe that it's at this crux of art science technology and public engagement uh, that will be essential in shaping equitable systems of healthcare and uh, regenerative systems moving forward one of the most moving statements uh, amongst many that we've heard from hca members we've been speaking to is that at the atomic level, we're all the same and we're here for a very temporary time. So make the most of it. And we've, yeah, we've been happy to uh, spend our time doing this so far. Uh, so leading up to our second workshop, we hosted a time travel luncheon where we invited um, a group of HCA members to zoom out of their immediate research and imagine the legacy of the wider field of cellular biology in 2120. And again, we were amazed with how uh, the scientists were able to, to speculate um, about their field and uh, move this forward into uh, the second workshop we did. So the final world building method that we've been using has been sensory ceremonies. And throughout all of our workshops and advisory panels and meetings with researchers, we've been integrating meditative visual storytelling into these uh, meetups. Um, sensory ceremonies are a method that we use in our work to engage people in, I guess, like information rich topics, but in a very tactile and meditative way. And this project has been an opportunity to really explore what this could mean uh, within the body and on a cellular level. So for the second workshop, we were we created a sensory toolkit, which has been sent, which was sent to members of the public and to human cell atlas researchers. And here is one of the kits that we sent them. And each of these elements were linked to a different sense. They were meant to ignite a sense in some way. And we use this as a starting point for engaging the body, uh, engaging in the body as a cellular being. So the best way we decided to describe what these, what these journeys are like is to invite you to take part in a very short 
meditative visual journey now. Um, we'd like you to close your eyes and Amanda will read out an excerpt from our second workshop. Um, we'd like you to, we'd ideally like you to have some little sensory uh, objects with you, but we, but we don't. So we'd actually like you to just put your palms together and kind of clasp your hands like that in your lap and sit comfortably and close your eyes and relax. Take a deep breath in and out. Feel the warmth and the subtle pulsing where your hands meet. Skin cushioned against skin, the largest organ of your body. A delicately patterned landscape. Valleys of indents, wrinkles, drawings etched in through years of flexing and wrapping to the world around it. The silky barrier between your internal body and the world around you. The top layer touching the other hand right now is the epidermis, made up of skin cells nestled closely together responding to the touch, sending molecular messages to your somatosensory system, a woven tapestry of sensory receptors, mechanoreceptors, sensing the location, texture, and movement of the meeting between your palms. Thermoreceptors, feeling the warmth coming from it. All these signals flow along your sensory nerves. A communication chain is flowing along your wrist, arm, up your shoulder and neck, up to the nearest neuron little nerve cells passing the message like a gift from neuron neighbor to neuron neighbor, one cell at a time until reaching your brain. Feel this connection between brain and palms. In this state of rest, of nurturing your cellular body, with your caring attention, open your palms and feel the air on your skin. Let this awareness float freely into your surroundings. Feel yourself, yourselves, as part of this porous, fluxing landscape. Human, microbial, and many other organic beings vibrant, responsive, transformative. Breathe in and out. And when you're ready, you can slowly open your eyes again. Welcome back. We hope you enjoyed that. We always quite enjoy uh, communicating our work in this way <laughs> it feels like okay, it uh, resonates um, now if we have a couple of minutes we would like to, to speak a little bit about the final artwork but I don't know if, if we've run out of time you have maybe a minute okay we'll do it in a minute <laughs> so for the final work we're gonna plan an online we're going to Sorry, I've been, I've gone into rest state now. <laughs> um, we are planning to create an online interface that encompasses some of the insights from our different interactions with the human cell, Atlas researchers, the advisory panel and the members of the public. These were some of the uh, key takeaways from one of the advisory panel meetings that we had that we're hoping to bring some of these um, yeah, some of these principles into the final work to really inform what the experience is like. 
it will be an online uh, environment and, and this space will present a cellular sanctum with different cellular sensing portals um, which once you enter them show you different possible futures of cellular biology and these scenarios will be woven with a guided meditative journey a bit like the one that we just gave which we're going to continue to develop through different conversations with human cell atlas researchers. We're currently looking into using augmented reality to emphasize the spatial sensorial aspect of this space that we're, we're interested in creating. And on the right, you see here, so on the left is an image of what the space could look like. And on the right, uh, yes, is, um, is a space where we hope people will be able to leave responses on this site, uh, building up a sort of layered mapped world to encompass the polyphony of different individual responses uh, to these possible futures. Yes, thank you. Uh, we're so excited to, uh, to uh, be joined by you all on this route into yet to be imagined possible futures. And uh, looking forward to speaking with you all. Thanks. Fabulous. Thank you so much for sharing your journey to date, Amanda and Rose, and for gifting us such a wonderful experience on this Saturday night. I really value that. Thank you. Um, I'm going to pass over to Justine Bussard, who's the creative engagement producer for um, our London Commission. Justine, if you'd like to take the mic. Yes. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, very nice to uh, to see you all. So I think I'll, I'll keep it um, I'll keep it quite short. But there was because there's so many points that have already been said. Um, you know, from thinking of the the public as not being just one woolly entity, but a series of experts in their own rights. Um, I think yeah, I think a lot of the of really important points have already been made, and I, I think I just wanted to. Um, maybe add another one, which is that despite the fact that we have been working uh, remotely, like all of our workshops have been done and our consultation have been done online, um, I was still really, really keen that we stayed focused on our area, which we had chosen, which was Peckham, because it felt like it still needed to, um, to be locally embedded for us to be really responsive to a place. And also another aspect, which was more maybe from a, an engagement perspective, was that although we were not on site, conversations were still happening on site. And so we eventually, because it was you know, it's quite a long process, there was eventually quite a lot of hearsay and we ended up having a really uh, nicely diverse network of people working, working with us and opening up to us. So the sense of, although it's online, location still matters, um, has been a, quite an important point for us. Um, and the second point is that, uh, as Rosa and Amanda mentioned, we put together a focus panel as our way of, um, of approaching this, uh, this challenge. And um, we made a very conscious decision from the beginning that we would bring HCA members and community members on an equal footing. And that would be as part of the community panel, but also as part of the workshops. So we had, uh, we, we had um, in particular two uh, really engaged HCA members who came to, so they were part of our panel and they came to every single uh, public workshop we did. And, but they were there as participants. They were not there to come and share a, a specific knowledge. Um, they were there as themselves and it has been very beneficial for them as well. So that was quite an interesting experiment. And I think, yeah, I think it worked quite well. So I think my provocation to you, Rose and Amanda, um, is that as artists, you're very well rehearsed in working with uh, scientists and other artists throughout your process, and maybe encountering the public, because your work is still always very participatory, maybe, maybe encountering the, the public, the infamous public, a bit at a later stage. Whereas with this, it was very much throughout the process. So I just wanted to ask you what has been the impact of working so locally and in such an embedded way with community members, very much as research partners and not just as participants. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, there have been many, many uh, wonderful ways that 
that working with members of the public, you know, right throughout has been really insightful and uh, beneficial to the work. I mean, I think that, uh, I think that the working together on the advisory panel and the key principles that we came to together was a real highlight maybe. Um, I really thought what was quite amazing was how in coming up with these uh, principles together, um, which were things like, uh, they were in that previous slide, but they were things like renewal and replenishment and uh, the impact of real, like real world effects uh, of doing rituals. What was quite amazing was uh, actually seeing the similarities uh, between researchers and members of the public and then also ones that were were brought in specifically from uh, different diverse uh, backgrounds so looking at the way in which uh, maybe a Christian view had slight clashes with a with a Buddhist uh, approach to donating the body and looking at the ways in which those intersected but then for example the Buddhist approach to uh, so body donation was actually quite similar to a human cell researcher's uh, approach. And so I think, yeah, seeing these different, different key principles um, was just fascinating to, to hear. Um, yeah, Amanda, I don't know if you also. Yeah, I think I can, I can add that we, uh, we've really enjoyed having so much engagement with both researchers and the public and this continuous feedback with many different perspectives. Wish we could always work like that. I guess it's how an ecosystem is successful as well, uh, being diverse and with many different uh, expertises present and uh, collaborating uh, to make it more strong and resilient. So uh, we've we've kind of come into it uh, not knowing that much about uh, the, the human cell atlas uh, science when we started this project. So we've been exploring together with people and it's felt like a very, uh, honest and uh, caring and safe space uh, to do it in. So it's been really valuable, yeah. Yeah, I love the idea that we've created a, a little ecosystem together. I think that's very beautiful. I love that too. I really like that. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda Rose. Thank you, Justine, for your wonderful insights and um, really valuable reflections there. I've really enjoyed that. Thank you. Um, and now to board and research, Paul and Vicky, um, who have been working with Catherine from Fusion Arts um, since October in Oxford. I'm really keen and delighted to hand over the mic, as it were, and um, yeah, gift you the screen. Oh. Hello, and thank you, Susie. Um, it's been a pleasure, like, seeing everyone's work, and, and I feel quite chilled now after Amanda's <laughs> session, so that's really nice. Um, so, yeah, we're just going to start with um, sharing our screen. Uh, so we want that one, do we? Okay. So hopefully you'll see our presentation. Uh, can everyone see that okay? Yeah, yeah. that works. And just okay. screen for it down. Okay, so I think everyone now knows who we are. And I think everyone recognizes that I'm Vicky and this is Paul. <laughs> and collectively we work as Boredom Research. Um, and as we've been saying in previous presentations, we've been kind of collaborating with scientists for about six years now. So on this slide, you kind of see four of our works that have been um, works that we've produced um, over in-depth kind of collaborations with um, scientists. Um, and um, what we're becoming with these projects, what we'll be becoming more intimately aware of the vulnerability of complex systems, um, including those which support human life on, on Earth. Um, and that's something that we've been thinking about whilst we've been addressing um, speculative normality, because this is obviously what we were looking at originally and, and have been exploring through this project. Um, so we've been collaborating with um, 
the human cell atlas um, scientists, in particular at the University of Oxford, um, and a scientist that we've been working closely with, Martin Polkowski, who works at the Human Center uh, for Human Genetics um, there. Um, and we've been working with Martin and, and another researcher, Mel, there to develop the narrative and the concepts of, um, of the film that we're creating, which is called Call of the Silent Cell. Um, and so Call of the Silent Cell will, will take this notion of the speculative normality, um, but it will look at it through the eyes of a cinematic experience of um, cellular behavior so centered on the interplay between uh, gut microbiology, also the immune system and wider concerns regarding environmental health. So we're really interested, like our previous works, of bringing or encouraging this holistic thinking, um, which like kind of um, reunites concepts of biomedical, but also environmental health. So so when we ask ourselves like um what it is to be normal it kind of forces us to to kind of respond you know in, in relation to what or you know normal is always in connection to something and when we think of norm um normality from a personal kind of um individual perspective it's all it's normally understood as as the relationship between an individual and their environment um, and 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 it kind of makes us wonder that when we think about you know humans in general and, and the relationship between humans and their environment, it's really uh, you know become, becoming increasingly aware that that's quite a destructive relationship. That um, that our relationship with the environment is one about degradation and degrading uh, and and degradating that um, environment, and and we carry on because it's normal, because everyone is doing the same thing, it, it makes it very hard to kind of break that cycle. When we kind of turn our thoughts inside the body and think of our immune systems, our immune systems are very much about trying to maintain homeostasis, trying to maintain that healthy kind of healthy balance. Um, and, and that's the kind of, that's considered the normal behavior of the, of the cells that make up our um, immune system and the and autoimmune disorders that um a, it's a dysfunctional immune system that then starts to act to degradate its environment um so in terms of um a normal healthy immune system we can think of it um, working to protect us um if we think of an ab abnormal or um um immune behavior is very one much about degradation. Don't we find the next slide, I need those speaker notes. <laughs> um, unless I've said all of that. Yeah, I think I have, haven't I? Yeah, yeah okay, so I'm, I'm, I'm kind of doing, uh, okay. Um, so, um, yeah, so the thing that really kind of struck us from the conversations with Martin was this understanding that we are materially redefining normality, that, um, it, it, in, that there's so much about immune disorders that are becoming increasingly more normal. It's increasingly normal to experience immune disorders. Um, and and they are kind of there's this similar kind of transition from something that we can consider as unnormal becoming very much um, normal, and it kind of makes us feel that normality is not something you know. There's always this question with when we think of the ideas of no, um, we can think of normality as something that we either strive for, or, or in terms of a desire to be normal. And often we think of that in terms of if we be suffering from ill health, whether that's um, um, physiological or, or kind of mentally, but it, it's also something that we might try and move beyond. Like if we think of some, someone being exceptional, that they are beyond kind of normal. But in terms of, the, uh, of this idea of, uh, of this sort of move towards, de um, to, towards degradation, that normality is something that we should be quite fearful of um 
and and it, it's something that we can be um, quite concerned about. And that, and I think it's it, it was this anxiety that was very much struck us from the conversations we had with um, Martin, where his his professional concern was very much about um, the immune system and the functioning of the immune system. But this very much kind of spilled over into an, an appreciation of how our um, how our impact on uh, environmental systems is actually um, impacting our the kind of the, the ecology inside us. So, um, it, um, and that's very much been the centre of the idea that we've kind of woven into this narrative structure um, that came from those conversations. I'm aware that I haven't said a few things, or so are we just moving on? Yeah, I cool. Think so, okay, because yeah, it's quite tight for time. Um, so these concepts that Paul's talking about, we're very much developing these as our central focus for the film Call of the Silent Cell. Um, and the narrative we've been working on with Martin and other researchers at Oxford University. Um, so the, the film narrative is centered around a, a protagonist who's an old man, um, and he experiences the revelation that um, his immune system is is vulnerable to environmental changes um, with microbial extinction being literally felt in the gut. Um, and so the film um, takes you on this journey um, and uh, where we have this voiceover artist who um, is starts in a forest at twilight and we hear his voice and he's questioning the nature of the microscopic world hidden from view. Um, so at nightfall, we see waves of light sweeping over the forest, which reveal details of the forest. Um, and this protagonist starts to consider the forest as not just trees, but a complex ecosystem, including microscopic life. Um, and so he experiences the revelation um, that his immune system is also vulnerable to environmental change, uh, with microbial extinction being literally felt in the gut. Um, and that's what we're working on at the moment. We're actually modelling um, this intestinal tract that the, uh, a camera will kind and of I think go that's through. one of the really kind of quite profound insights that, you know, very much that we might think of um, things like, aggregate, you know, a kind of intensive agricultural practices that they are kind of creating huge amounts of, 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 of changes in the landscape that um, degradate that landscape but also it means that there's profound changes in what we eat and what and those kind of profound changes are changing their internal ecology and kind of almost like if we think of the way that we have toxic algal blooms that we have a similar kind of phenomenon inside ourselves that overwhelming our our internal kind of micro microbiotic landscape with particular um, particular nutrients creates these profound distortions and those distortions then feed back to um, the way that our immune system understands its environment and that's very much the kind of um, woven into the um, narrative of the film. Yeah and um, and so this camera that goes through the intestines and, and there's some ambiguity between the forest and, and the the gut as well so you're transported into these worlds almost seamlessly well we hope seamlessly yeah, that, that's what we're working on. <laughs> um, so in this particular shot that you're seeing now the camera pulls back through the through the intestines um, and it's darkened by the shadow of trees um, to emerge again in the forest at night and we're going to play hopefully if we've got time we're going to play a really short clip so it's kind of hot off the press um, because well, of, incomplete, you yeah, could say, work and in production. Work in progress. Um, so hopefully, um, but this will give you an idea of the simulation that we're working on. Um, and hopefully you're gonna be able to hear it as well. So let's see. So can you see the video playing? Yeah. yeah. Cool. The storm has arrived. Not of breath and air, but of cells and their signals.
gusts of senseless immunity in a broken world they no longer comprehend. Um, so that would give you, because we've just been showing lots of images, so it's kind of nice to see something moving, <laughs> a bit of animation. Um, so, um, so basically this is the, what we're working on now is the cytokine storm. So this like overreaction of the immune system and uh, what, what you saw there was like um, these villes, which are, are kind of like tiny little hairs, aren't they? So they're kind of yeah. finger-like instructions. So I suppose their job is just to increase the surface area of the gut lining to, you know, maximize the amount of contact between um, you know the cells that um, and, and, the, and the micro kind of biota that just provides kind of environmental real estate isn't it that's that's what's going on there yeah um, but and yeah so we're currently working on the simulation of a cytokine storm um, on the epithelial cells that's kind of very boiled down and and um, um, I'm trying to remember what the next slide is um, so this will just give you a bit of background about how we're producing this. Um, so, um, which is effectively like an animated texture that's mapped onto that that sea of um, ville. Um, and, and we used like an ocean simulation technique as well because we wanted it to feel like you were being swept by um, like a storm. Yeah, so um, the kind of... It, We've just made the transition from the fries, where there's been this idea of a brewing storm, and we've kind of, and that has manifested inside the body rather than outside of the body. Um, but yeah, so we're currently working on on. We, so we're now um, we're, we're sort of trying to work out the most efficient way to map that into a three three D where we're literally generating the cells on the um, on the villa and trying to work out, you know, just kind of feasibly how we can do that. Um, with the kind of with the volumes of cells that we're trying to work with to allow that kind of stimulation to have some kind of quality that really kind of captures this up this kind of reactive reactive space of cellular communication. This is the first time we've kind of worked like this. So we normally do like real time rendering. So it's taking like hours to render this amount of cell space out, which is which is kind of interesting and challenging at the same time. Um, so all this work has been developed from um, the workshops that we did with um, two uh, community groups. Um, so we worked with two colleges and we were interested in working with um, teenagers. Um, originally, we thought they were going to be um, into coding, um, but we realized like halfway through <laughs> that they hadn't done a lot of coding. Um, so we had to kind of change um, the interface. So we created this piece of software called Cyt Cytokine Storm, um, where the teenagers could create um, four different cell types um, within that space. Like, so healthy cells, infected cells, activated cells, and killer cells. Um, and how they created their cells is that we did histology, very simple histology techniques with them where they used vegetables um, and dyed those um, to get these like really beautiful, um, unique cells to map within that space. Um, so it was a really kind of fun, kind of hands-on hybrid workshop as well, because they were doing a bit of wet lab stuff, but also doing um, simulation work. So in the bottom um, right, you can see this is one of the simulations that one of the students created. Um, so these are like 16 to 18 year olds. Um, and it was the first time they'd ever done anything like this. Um, so they really gained from that experience. Yeah. And then the last workshop, we invited the scientists along to um, diagnose their um, simulations of immune systems, um, which was really fun. So Krishna came along and Muzz as well, um, and they responded to all the different simulations that the students had created um, and um, you know, perhaps what was happening in the body if, if we were to see something like this on a cellular um, automata level. Um, so we're just going to just, because we're probably running out of time, but um, I wanted to talk a little bit about 
what we've learned from this because Susie asked us to respond about um you know maybe how this is a bit different or um, what experiences we've gained from this um and we could talk like we could probably write a whole paper on what um, the collaborative process has been like with the scientists, which has been phenomenal. Um, we've had really in-depth conversations with them and they've really inputted into the, the narrative of this piece as well, which, you know, we've taken central themes and concerns of theirs and built those into the narrative. We wouldn't be able to do it justice in the time we have, so we're going to show you instead some kind of um, um, uh, improvised camera rigs that we've built out of wood. Um, so yeah, so we've done a huge amount of of just uh, DIY stuff, because uh, we've had a bit of time on our hands being in lockdown as well. Um, so just building some camera rigs um, and also doing a lot of new techniques that we haven't done before with uh, macro shots of the forest, um, which has been really fun and trying out different lenses and stuff like that. Um, and also this is completely new to us because we've never done any camera tracking before. And not only have we never done any camera tracking, but we've never done it in the dark, which is really hard. So we spent a lot of time in the forest, kind of ending up in bogs um, with like these tracker markers, um, trying to track parts of the forest so that we could um, recomposite um, our own trees. Because the idea is that one of these trees will be covered in moths, so which will kind of reveal that structure. Um, so there's another segment that we're kind of going to work on. Um, but yeah, so that's been a really interesting um, process. Um, and we'd just like to thank the two core scientists. Obviously, we've had loads and loads of discussion with other scientists across all the labs, but um, these are the two core, Martin and Mel. They've that, been really generous yeah. with their time and, 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 and also with their kind of enthusiasm, really, and, 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 um, and kind of positive response to um the project and the way that it, it's it, it, I mean, it the way that it's kind of um um maybe it kind of expressed some of the ideas in ways that they wouldn't be able to in their normal kind of everyday working practice yeah so we'll end there thank you are we on the time no. was we ahead of time all oh, right okay no you weren't <laughs> okay. well, you definitely weren't worth it, weren't. No, no. <laughs> worth it. <laughs> Thank you so much. Always fascinating to, to, to see your, your, your rigs and the kind of um, process that you guys are going through um, in terms of creating this, this response. So thank you so much. That was absolutely fascinating. Um, I'm going to go over to Catherine now from Fusion Arts. Um, and Catherine has, and Fusion Arts um, have been leading on the community engagement aspect of facilitating uh, Vicky and Paul going in and meeting these younger students. Um, so the mic is yours, Catherine, for a bit of reflection and a question. Right. Um, I will try to keep it short. Um, I have been thinking about starting with why did Fusion actually get involved in this commission? Like, why were we super keen to be part of this? And of course, there is there is this aspect that we have a long standing history of um, connecting with local communities and we have or we still act as a bridging organization for museum science organizations, artists, local communities in Oxfordshire and beyond. But what it was really about was the content of this commission where um, we were super keen to explore the point where boundaries of arts and science blur, merge blend, bend, to short, like where innovation happens. Um, and through our arts program, we always seek to positively impact on health and well-being. So there is this natural interest for us to, to be involved in a science, health, well-being arts project. Um, to just um, quote, quote our uh, application is where the definitions break down is the point of fruitful artistic investigation where contemporary art and science practice becomes social practice and vice versa so this really holds our particular interest um, and then to bridge over to working with boredom research um, what really speaks to us and what was really great since the start of this project has been the conversational way in which um, we have been delivering this program together. And um, I feel that really puts everyone in their strength. So um, on 
reflecting on working with boredom research in particular, um, where I feel like I did you short yesterday. Um, I must say like working with Vicky and Paul is, um, has been incredibly inspiring. Um, and our shared approach building like the one cell at a time project um, has been, has felt like a partnership and it has been really process driven, which was of course led by the nature of the commission for a part, but uh, mainly led by um, the situation that we're in like the ever changing landscape of um, rules around um, negotiating um, COVID-19, um, not being able to have live workshops, in-person workshops. And um, on a personal note, I just really want to say, I want to describe uh, Vicky and Paul to you as extremely experienced, dedicated, professional, um, and at the same time, absolutely some of the most fun artists I ever worked with. Um, I think we should just end there. That's lovely. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Thank you all. Thank you all very much. Good evening now. I want to, I want to just skip. Yeah, um, we could go away with that warm feeling. That's nice. Yeah. Um, yeah. On, on and the now for the really kind yeah, of Yeah, did you want to ask us a question? <laughs> um, I think I'm just going to skip like the, the groups that we worked with because it will, I, I save my question for the Q&A, but um, I think from a fusion point of view, like the, the expectations, like live workshops, the hackathon, a touring exhibition has been very different from like the COVID reality. And um, I have the feeling that we may have delivered like a different project or program if, it, if we wouldn't have been in lockdown all the time. So we might have worked with more intergenerational and less connected groups. Um, but I think as I said before, I led, led by the situation that we were in and um, the fact that we had to adapt and we had to, or we worked closely with these colleges that we worked with. Um, you guys have delivered a workshop series and actually um, unintentionally, it feels like delivered a piece of gaming software that is easy enough to be digestible for students to use like remote without any supervision. And it is just this simple and clear tool to, um, to simulate like incredibly complex behaviors, which, uh, which I think is absolutely amazing. And um, that kind of leads to, to like our findings or reflections. It's, um, it was, really mind-blowing to discover together um, how close art and science actually lie together where they overlap and um, also when I got involved in this project it felt like it was it was set up as a one-way street where it is um, science engaging with the public through the art but um, actually like to just cling to this example of this new piece of software being created. Um, there is like, you, you made this piece of software that um, physically explores like a visual representation um, of an autoimmune response, which the, art, uh, the, the scientists picked up on said like, this can be really helpful. And so it became like this, this two-way street where, where real like giving and taking and interaction is taking place. And we just really love um, to be in the sweet spot where we feel like the things, art, science um, aren't quite defined yet. And we feel, I feel incredibly blessed to um, be part of developing that language that actually defines what that spot and place is. Um, so yeah, I, I guess I'll, I'll just leave it there and maybe just hint at that um, through or because we have been involved with this commission, um, we already see like in Oxford that it has led to an increased um, collaboration or awareness um, and an interest between the colleges and uh, arts and the university. So mm -hmm. this uh, I would say is, is like, 
already incredibly successful. So I want to thank everyone for, for this opportunity and for this project. Right. Right. <laughs> it was really interesting with the software because it was very much something that we kind of we did yeah. as a crisis management really when when you know we realized that the workshops were going to go online it's like delivering coding workshops or doing coding workshops with kind of kids remotely was something that was mm. was suddenly like well how on earth is this going to work online so I'd that like was to, a real kind of yeah i'd like to stress all, faith. also and, and that was... we were learning on the job because <laughs> we were learning a new game engine as yeah. well so, <laughs> so that maybe helped a bit because we could kind of like sympathize with the students like and understand what they had to learn but it was a know? real surprise how yeah. positively a lot of the scientists responded to that and saw it as something that was really kind of useful i mean martin's really been kind of raving over it, yeah, Martin so. wants to go public with the software, which is really cool. So he wants to make it available to other students as well, even med students as well, which is really cool. So amazing, amazing. I do, I do think you know the the um, we're all in this together. <laughs> <laughs> God, kind of idea has has definitely resonated in each of the different projects as we as we cross. Um, the, the UK, I think that's been definitely something that's fed into everybody's process, to be honest. I'm conscious that we've, we've come to um, a point where we were supposed to ramp up and I want, want I mean, I'm happy for obviously people to, to have to go, but just before you do, I would like to open up the floor if anybody has any questions who's joined us tonight for any of our, any of our um, city teams that we've, that's been presenting tonight. And while you talk, maybe Justine, you had a, a question that I think might be interesting for a quick response from each of our commissioned artists. But actually, I was thinking, and, um, and I really hope, Jess, you won't mind me putting you on the spot. It's really nice to see you tonight. Um, but I know that you come from a design practice and a design background. And so I was wondering what your perspective is on seeing all of these art commissions uh, so Jess runs uh, this amazing company called uh, Design for Disability, and so I'm really pleased you were able to uh, to come with us tonight. So actually, if it's okay, Sudi, to actually ask the question to the audience rather than the panel. Please, uh, let's <laughs> roll with that, absolutely. Is that okay, Jess? Oh. You're just on mute there. Hello, can you hear me? We can. Yes, of course. Hi. No, I've been uh, I've been um, listening in. Uh, it's very, very, very interesting, actually. Um, but yeah, shoot. <laughs> yeah, so I think, and it was um, one of the questions I actually wanted to ask everyone. It's because uh, I, I myself come more from a design background, which is always very solutions oriented and, and trying to be like as clear as possible. And um, and so I, at the beginning of this project, I felt like, uh, ooh, I, is actually working with artists, making things a bit more complicated and confusing. And actually that's not what happened at all. Um, it actually opened up to much more, uh, I think much deeper conversations. And so as I know that you'll come from this very much this design background as well. I was wondering whether you had any thoughts to share on what you think the value of art science is. And it's such a big question and you must be tired. I'm sorry, I'm putting you on the spot, but I'm just curious to hear it. That's okay, that's okay. Apologies if my internet might be a bit frozen. It's kind of glitching on my end, but yeah, I am um, uh, just for those of those, for those that you don't know, I run a design, kind of consultancy um, company that's actually going through a bit of a rebranding at the moment um, called Design for Disability, um, which is all about um, including, uh, you know, end users who identify as disabled um, to kind of design and uh, make products um, led by user, like led, led by the users. Um, but yeah, it's been a really kind of fascinating um, uh, conversation <laughs> uh, this evening. Um, and it's really nice kind of hearing from, like hearing a more 
kind of scientific point of view, I think, um, as well. Like I've always been quite fascinated in, uh, I mean, I've, I've, brought up, I've been brought up in a very medical environment. You know, my, my father's a, a psychiatrist. Um, and my mother was kind of a, a doctor, uh, a PR health consultant. So I've always had a real fascination for like um, biology or science. Um, but it's really nice, actually. I, I was um, when I was listening to, I think it was somebody talking about speculative futures and kind of sensory interactions um, and designing kind of DIY sensory toolkits. That's kind of really. Um, I really love that area of just being able to kind of identify what the need is of the user and 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 kind of telling the story through the user as opposed to just kind of having it as a like a sticker if that makes sense. Um, so yeah, that's kind of what came out extracted that to me, I, I guess, um, that this evening. Um, but yeah, thank you for all of your wonderful talks and the insights um, and I look forward to kind of hearing more I guess. <laughs> Thank you Jess. Thank you so much. Okay, okay. Um, I'm going to leave it there and um, just say thank you so much. This has been really special. Hashtag proud curator. <laughs> It's been such a, an amazing opportunity to, to kind of convene an incredible group of minds um, who've just put so much heart and tenacity and energy into an incredible project that's really made the most of an awesome context and subject matter um, to make really vital work that I think is incredibly important um, and will be shared to all in November through a virtual exhibition, um, which, which I hope that you will engage with um, at that time as well. But um, just a heartfelt thank you. You've all been amazing tonight. I've genuinely enjoyed every moment of every presentation and every question and every reflection. They're all hugely valuable and the work you've done has been hugely valuable. So with that, I will say good night and let you go off and eat your dinner. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks, Thanks Susie. Susie. Thanks, everyone. Thank Take care. Bye. 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 Bye.